Hi, Claire and James here. Just before we get stuck into this week's episode, we wanted to let you know the exciting news that the Midlife Reset Audit is now live. This is a first of its kind personalized diagnostic tool designed for midlifers by midlifers. In just three minutes, the audit will help you pinpoint what's really holding you back from living your healthiest, happiest midlife. And most importantly, provide tailored strategies on how to take back control. Midlife doesn't have to be a time of uncertainty. It can be an era of growth, discovery and well-being. So to go ahead and take the audit, go to themidlifementors.com forward slash audit. Navigating the complexities of modern day relationships can be overwhelming and often we don't have the tools and understanding to deal with it effectively. In this episode, we talk to psychologist and licensed sex therapist, Dr. Kate Ballesteri about retroactive jealousy, infidelity, sex and intimacy and how best to communicate our emotions. This is an incredibly real and enlightening conversation with so much advice on how to get the best from your relationship. And we know you're going to really enjoy listening to this one. Hi, I'm James Davis. And I'm Claire Davis. We're the Midlife Mentors, here to lift the lid on how to achieve health and happiness. The balanced, no-nonsense way. And welcome to another episode of the Midlife Mentors with me, James. And me, Claire. I'm just saying that James probably needs to get a little bit closer to the screen because I'm much louder than him, as Always everyone knows. Always your booming voice. <laughs> um, so what have we been up to? You did your men's course, which yeah, was amazing. Yeah, I ran my men's course last week, which is great. I had a great group of guys on there. Um, and we were, I was kind of educating them on what's going on with testosterone for guys at midlife, how they can naturally help optimize their levels, but like digging into like some of the things that really matter, like, you know, are you still living to your values? Uh, are you setting goals outside of work and career? How are your relationships? What are you doing to, to nourish your relationships? So we dived into all that and it, it was really great to run it and have the interaction from the guys. So that yeah. was, I think we'll do more of that stuff. You are going to do more of that stuff. And I've just been bimbling around doing my one-to-one coaching. It's all been, it's all been, been a bit quiet on the, on the Western front for me. But you've been a little bit busier than me. I've been, I've been a little bit busier, a little bit busier. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, let's um, introduce our guest today. We're very, very excited. So excited for this one. So we're joined by Dr. Kate Ballesteri, who's a psychologist and licensed sex therapist from America. And yes. she, she had practices in Beverly Hills, in Miami, all over. And we're just going to talk relationships, intimacy, jealousy, all kinds of things. Kate, welcome. Well, I'm jealous currently that um, Kate's in Miami, but welcome. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm excited to talk with you both. Yeah, we are too. So why don't we just dive straight in, Kate, if that's okay. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about your background and what actually drew you to specialize in the field of um, sex therapy and relationships and intimacy? Yeah, of course. Um, I I got into the field of psychology as a second career, actually. I used to sell health insurance and employee benefit plans, but I really felt like I needed something a little more artful for the next several decades of life. So I went back to school and um, pursued psychology. And at that time, I, I wanted to get into the field to become the next Clarice Starling and do a lot of forensic evaluations and really understand criminal behavior. Um, So my first foray in this work was as a forensic psychologist, and I spent years working in correctional settings with sexually violent persons and non-sexually violent persons doing all kinds of evaluations, expert witness testimony, and treatment um, for folks. And it was in that work, specifically my work with sex offenders, that I really started to get a lot more curious and surprised by the relationship that people had with sex and the absence of pleasure <clears throat> that sex uh, that was in com- that, that accompanied sex in their lives, and what I mean by that is, so much, so many of the offenders that I worked with really didn't know how to have sex for pleasure. They had sex for power, and <clears throat> that to me was really interesting. The way that people could utilize sex 
to express all of these other unmet relational needs. And it really took a toll, of course, on victims' lives, um, but also on the perpetrators' lives. And I started to see just these, these gaping deficits in understanding that they had with themselves. And I thought, wow, you know, this is the, the more profound end of this continuum. But out in the world and non-incarcerated populations, you know, the rest of us, the, the walking worried, um, you know, we use sex for some pretty interesting things too. And I started to get a lot more curious on the role that, that sex plays in people's lives. So when I decided to leave corrections and the forensic space, I really got more into understanding the interplay between sex, mental health and relationships. And that's where my private practice has existed ever since. Wow. And how long ago was that, Kate? That I was working in, in forensics? Yeah. And when you decided to leave and set up your practice? Yeah. Um, I, I have had a private practice overlapping some time that I worked in the prisons for about five or six years. But I would say I left the prisons altogether in 2016. It just wow. became wow. too much. And I um, imagine. from that That's point quite on, heavy going. Quite heavy going. Amazing that you did that, though. Such an, it's such an interesting route, though, that, that by, by working in that environment with those kind of perpetrators, that led you to actually like, okay, but what's going on for everyone else with, with uh, you know, intimate and sexual relationships? Like, that's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it has been, honestly, just a, an endless point of curiosity. And the more I learn about sex, the more I realize none of us know about sex. And that's been right. fun too. It's just constant <laughs> investigation. <laughs> do you, I'm going to ask you, do you think um, relationships and intimacy have become more difficult to navigate or more complex with the advent of, of technologies and this in particular like social media? It's a great question. I, I don't know how to answer that, but, it, but it's a question that comes up in the field quite a bit, you know, uh, are we more complicated and nuanced now with social media or are we more aware of the nuance and complications that have always existed? Um, I would say it's probably a little of both. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Social media gives us this extra dimension of artificiality and uh, gamification and two dimensionality, which in many ways uh, dehumanizes us. And I think has furthered and perpetuated a bit of commodification of sex and relationship and mm -hmm. certainly has become a, a stage upon which we we present and and demonstrate and perform our relationships with sex romance love marriage all of those things so i think that it, it probably is fair to say that whatever has existed in human behavior before social media has become amplified and so we, right. we do have more awareness now of the implications of that. And we're still learning the implications of that, for sure. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that. I mean, um, my observation through, through people I know is that you know, in, in the dating world, the kind of the rise of the, of the dating apps has, has made, it, it, it's kind of condensed dating down to the same as ordering a Deliveroo, you know, or an Uber Eats. It's kind of like, oh, just to swipe, swipe, swipe. Oh, you know, I have a conversation with that person. I'm not feeling a connection in a really short time. It's just on to the next one. There's people don't seem willing to invest in their relationships in the same way. I guess maybe we did 20, 30 years ago. We actually went out and met people in person and you kind of made the effort and the, and the time investment already. So it's, it's quite interesting to think how that plays out. But at the same time, then it does... I guess offer a big, big topic I read about recently was like micro cheating, like, you know, commenting or liking on other people's posts or, and all that kind of stuff. Is so it's a, a whole, thing? whole crazy world out there. Wow. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a real thing. And every partnership has their own fidelity agreements. So in some partnerships, they may not care about stuff like that, but in others, it might feel like a huge transgression. Yeah. Yeah. Now you deal with like a massive range of of relationship issues but um a couple of ones are really interesting to me the first one i'll talk about is the concept of retroactive jealousy could you explain mm. that yeah yeah well first the the topic of jealousy is so interesting right it, it can be so constructive and so destructive depending on our relationship with jealousy but retroactive jealousy is different than just plain old like good old-fashioned jealousy in the sense that <laughs> 
The jealousy is focused on relationships or sexual experiences that occurred before partners got together. So so a partner might be really obsessed with the sexual experiences that a partner had in their last relationship or two relationships ago, um, as opposed to, you know, good old fashioned jealousy, as we understand it, you go out to a bar or a pub with your, with your partner and somebody's hitting on them. That's jealousy in the here and now, right? That's a potential threat to the relationship in the here and now. But retroactive is like what happened there and then becomes a threat to the here and now. So it's it's particularly um, painful for folks because a lot of them logically understand that my partner doesn't want to be with that person anymore or they love me for me. This isn't really a threat. And yet they can't stop ruminating or obsessing about whatever it is they're fixated on from their partner's past. Mm. Mm. Wow. I mean, that is a deep one. I think I had a little touch of that when we got I together. Wondered I wondered whether you were I going... I mean, I'm all about being open. So yeah, yeah. It was, and it was a new sensation for me because I, I'm saying I'm not naturally uh, a jealous person, but definitely I, I did have that, didn't James, I? James, definitely. It's really interesting, Kate, as you're explaining that because um, you definitely had retroactive jealousy. Yeah. Um, and it was hard for to navigate for the both of us, of course, because what you're saying is that person does know that it doesn't really of course it makes sense to them because they're feeling it and their feelings are valid but it's it's kind of like the person I'm with I'm kind of bringing the past in I know that they don't want to be with that person anymore they've chosen to be with me so why do I feel like this and I could see it was just ripping James apart because he knew that consciously intellectually but his emotions were telling him something different right right yeah I mean we can sort of think about it and like our emotions are information. First of all, there's no such thing as good and bad information. They're all information. So when people um, are experiencing retroactive jealousy, it's often an indicator that they really have good, like strong feelings for someone and they're afraid to lose that person. And so our mind in sort of the, the face of ambiguity, right, which is this relationship going to last is kind of an ambiguous question. We just don't know when we get together with someone, how, how long the duration of a relationship will be. So in the face of that ambiguity, a lot of folks, um, well, most humans will try to fixate on something. It doesn't matter if it's true or not in reality, but the illusion of, okay, I've got, I've got a reason for why I should be scared now, or I've got a reason for how this will end that gives our brain this illusion of safety, right? So this fixation about whatever was back then gives the brain something to chew on. And it's like, okay, well, if I can just make sense of whatever happened then, then I can protect the relationship today in the here and now. And so, you know, it's often about feeling insecure and adequate or vulnerable in some way. And when partners can be transparent about their feelings and honest about it, they usually can work through it. But if they're kind of sitting on that by themselves and living in that Mm. agony or weaponizing it against their partner and accusing their partner of things, it can definitely become a prickly third in the relationship. Yeah. I think we were very blessed that we could talk about it and communicate it with it. And you actually, through it. Yeah. Just reflecting then, you know, I think I was in a very insecure time. I, you know, I'd come, I'd come out of a a very long marriage and divorce. Um, We, we hadn't had the best dating history when we did get together. <laughs> what he's so. trying to say here, Kate, in brackets, is that I, I led him down a garden path for a little while, is what he's trying to say in brackets. <laughs> so I think that, that helps me make sense of it even more. But yeah, I think by talking about it and, and we were able to navigate it and just being open about yeah, it. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. And like, what would you say, Kate, are some of, obviously, that kind of insecurity, um, um, some of the triggers? Are there any other kind of common triggers that really yeah, create that retroactive jealousy? Yeah, I mean, really, when we think about it, it's it's kind of a relationship uh, obsession or an attachment wound of sorts. Right. So obsession, yeah, obsession and, and rumination are a way that the brain protects against this idea of scarcity. So if I think you're going to reject me, or you've had someone better than me, or the sex that you had before was even better than our sex, 
like, wow, you might leave me. And that's really scary. So obsession is, is the brain's counterbalance to that. And so retroactive jealousy, again, gives this illusion of control. If I just obsess, 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 it's almost like I'm possessing this person or this idea. And that gives me this sense of safety. So it really often is um, reflective of an underlying abandonment fear. So interesting. That goes as well, doesn't it? Yeah, so that really reflects for you as well, doesn't it? it? This is very helpful. Really helpful. (laughs) And really helpful for everyone listening, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone else is like, oh. Well, Hey, it's like everything, right? Once we once we bring awareness to it, that helps us understand it and bring compassion, and then we can start to alter our behavior from there. Exactly, exactly, right? When partners get that, they can provide different kinds of reassurance. They can develop other kinds of relationship strengthening activities, trust building activities together, and and eventually they can move through that with time. Usually, mm-hmm. yeah. Now. Um, Moving back to, well, I guess retroactive jealousy or good old current jealousy. Uh, do you see there's a sliding <laughs> scale there between like like a healthy level, like you know, well, I get this. Like if if a, if a guy is talking to you in a bar, I'll be kind of like be like, Rrr. and I think that's good because it shows I care. Mm. Um, to the mm. other end of the spectrum would be unhealthy, where you know you lock someone in the house and they're not allowed to leave. So, <laughs> like, what, what's the what's the distinction between like healthy and unhealthy, and how can how can people like, manage that? Yeah, a great distinction. Um, it definitely, if somebody is engaging in controlling or possessive behaviors, the jealousy has become destructive, right? That kind of behavior is often going to drive a wedge way more often than it will help bring people closer together. But where jealousy mm. can be really healthy and beneficial, as I said earlier, emotions are not good or bad, they're information. So when someone feels jealous, that's information. Ooh, how am I feeling? I have something so good that I don't want to lose this person. That's informative, right? Yeah. And I can talk about that with my partner. I'm crazy about you. And I got so scared that we may not make it. How do you feel? Are you in the same boat, right? It becomes intimacy, connective tissue when you yes. can use it as information, right? But when people are not as conscious of, of their emotions, especially their scary emotions, Um, or vulnerable emotions as information, then they try to control the external variables, i.e. their partner, to minimize Mm. the threat of those emotions. So I think um, it becomes destructive when people don't have good emotion regulation skills, when they don't have good insight, and when they're not feeling uh, either able or willing to communicate what they're feeling with their partner. But if they are, it can become really solidifying in their partnership, which is great. it's really positive to hear it kind yeah. of um, reframed in that way, isn't it? Because actually we can really beat ourselves up for feeling these things. But actually, if we can reframe it, actually, I could use this to be more intimate and connect with my partner more. This can really take us to another beautiful level. Absolutely. And that's what the fear is about at its core, right? I, I'm afraid that we may not make it. So I'm jealous of whatever the threat might be. But if you can use that threat as a way to, to create more security, well, then it's a beautiful end. Really, thing. I really love that. Amazing love thing. that. Uh, we'll move on to a like, slightly different topic now, which is going to be um, infidelity and betrayal. I guess that, that's crossing the jealousy lines where something actually has happened. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, what what are most some of, some of the common reasons you see for people engaging in infidelity, and how can couples address these issues once once they're occurring? Yeah, I mean there are there are so many reasons why people engage in infidelity. Um, I'll just sort of list off a litany of them. Um, one, they are entitled, and they just feel like they should be able to have their cake and eat it too. Start with the most pernicious. Um, Really, really blunt. I deserve it. Yeah, that's it. I want my cake and eat it. And then another one. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Three more slices, please. But don't tell anyone. Um, (laughs) So, I mean, there is that. There is that component. And we have to acknowledge that, especially living in a patriarchal world, that that conditions men to sort of define their masculinity and their confidence often by how many people they've slept with. And certainly men aren't the only people who cheat, but, <clears throat> but it is a common variable for men who are seeking something in their identity, right? They're seeking to 
shore up a sense of masculinity. And sexual virility is one of the ways that they do that. So I think entitlement is one way that that, uh, infidelity can happen. But also um, really deep insecurity. Someone's trying to uh, find out if they are desired. Are they valued? Do people want them? Um, Do they have a backup plan in case this relationship doesn't work? As I mentioned, when we're talking about jealousy, for a lot of folks with abandonment fears, uh, it's not uncommon for them to be talking to multiple people because, and then if one relationship doesn't work out, I've got all these backups to convince me that I'm good enough, right? I'm not saying that that makes it okay, but we have Mm. to understand the underlying psychology. Um, so for some people, it's uh, it's really a conflicted decision, right? They really love their partner. And also there's something that is unmet in the relationship and they don't want to disrupt their relationship. And also going without that unmet need, whatever that might be, it could be, again, feeling desired or it could be um, their partner has um, a medical condition and they are not able to be sexual with them and they're feeling a longing for that. Um, Could be that they have really mismatched sexual interests. One person might be kinky, one person might be vanilla and Mm -hmm. might be really tricky for them to feel satisfied together if they are not communicating appropriately. Um, So lots of reasons. And and one of the reasons I think that goes really uh, under discussed is that people are often trying to find a connection to a part of themselves they feel they've lost. And so infidelity becomes a way that they explore that. And again, none of these make it okay. And when we understand the reasons that people do engage in infidelity behavior, we can try to um, get ahead of it more aptly with partners. That's really, really fascinating that you've just said that, that it's a way of trying to find out something that they feel like they've lost Mm. in themselves. That's yeah. I've never really kind of explored it in that way before. No, but that's that's so. In- I, I'm just actually thinking that I, c- I can see how that happens. Like particularly, I guess in a longer term relationship, where they feel they've compromised, compromised, compromised. Mm-hmm. Maybe they have abandoned a lot of the other interests that they had, mm-hmm. and even friendship mm-hmm. groups. And they're like, "Well, who am I now?" It could mm-hmm. be that search for identity. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of want to be. We're always really super honest on this podcast, and you've just said about um, our relationship at the beginning. But you know, my first husband, I. Um, had an affair and I think what you're saying there about about actually having my options open it was about not feeling enough it absolutely was and so that recognition even for me is very very comforting and I'm able to be a bit more compassionate with myself there again it's something that I've not really it's when you open up and talk about this stuff um that you actually realize it doesn't make it okay and I, I think it absolutely is. That's the truth what, that you, you've said a couple of times now. It doesn't make it okay. But if, again, if we're kind of like good people, we don't necessarily understand what yeah. was driving us. It does help us feel a bit more compassionate about ourselves. And for me, it was definitely, it was definitely that feeling of not enoughness and being scared that I was going to lose something. So kind of keeping my options open and that, that external validation really that I couldn't create in myself. Yeah. 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 I'm glad to hear that you have some compassion for yourself now hearing that. I mean, <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's been a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very common. It's very common. And it's also common for people in longer term relationships to feel like, um, well, in long term relationships, I'm sure, I don't know how long you two have been together, but, you know, things kind of get monotonous after a while. You know each other really well. It's super familiar. And that can be wonderful and beautiful and also really boring sexually. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes we we seek out something sexual to experience a hit of novelty, but also to feel the way we once felt about ourselves mm. or in our own bodies mm. or with pleasure when when something feels like it's too too familiar to have enough erotic tension in a long-term partnership. So I think, Uh, you know, there's just, there's a lot of dynamics. And I find that when people do not vilify themselves or their partner, they can work through infidelity in a much more meaningful way. Of course, I'm not suggesting everyone stay with their partner when that happens, but, you know, for the people who want to, um, it really can help to humanize 
the behavior and really get a better understanding. Um, that, of course, uh, is is only predicated on the fact that hopefully the the fidelity violating partner has true remorse and really is looking to have that growth yeah. as well. Often they don't. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I, I was going to ask, you know, if there has been infidelity, how, how do, can couples work to rebuild that trust if, if both of them want mm-hmm. to do that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's slow. It's steady. I mean, trust, trust is built with reliability and consistency and transparency over time. So you can't just convince someone overnight, look, hey, everything's fine. It'll be different. I promise that's not going to rebuild trust. Those are beautiful words and many people like to hear them, but it doesn't address the somatic um, rupture that has happened in terms of safety between two people. So often the fidelity violating um, partner gets very frustrated because they want this to be under the rug swept and let's move on and I'm not going to do it again and I love you and here I am and I'm going to therapy and I'm doing the things, but so why can't you just move on? But for a lot of people who have been betrayed, it, it becomes a trauma that lives mm-hmm. in the body because you you believe that your person has signed up for all the same things that you've signed up for. And if they violate those agreements without a conversation first, I mean, it can just really feel like such a gut mm-hmm. punch and mm-hmm. it can leave residual trauma, uh, trauma effects in the body similar to that of being sexually assaulted. Um, the, the trauma experience afterward is, is dire for a lot of folks. And, and I think a lot of, um, people really underestimate that both people who have been cheated on and people who have cheated, because it's really scary and hard to think like, wow, I've hurt this person so gravely. And wow, this person I love has hurt me so gravely. So, you know, it it takes some time to process, but when people are willing to be humble with each other, uh, slow down in their conversations, learn how to regulate their own emotions. I mean, the fidelity violating partner needs to be able to hold space for the betrayed partner and not get butt hurt when they bring it up over and over again, because their, their traumatized mind is trying to make sense of what happened and why they could do this. And will it happen again? And those safety seeking behaviors are healthy and adaptive Mm -hmm. and to be expected and they're unavoidable. But they also evoke a lot of shame and a lot of guilt in the fidelity violating partner. And that partner doesn't know what to do with those feelings often. So they sort of hot potato it back and say, you've got to get over this. It's over. It's done. I can't talk to you about this anymore. And then they get dropped again, right? So the trauma just keeps getting perpetuated over and over again. And that is the process that really elongates couples healing trajectories. Yeah. And this is where I suppose that support comes in, right? The the therapy, the sitting with a third party to help navigate some of this the anger, the shame, these emotions that you're you're talking about here. Um, I mean, James and I have had marriage, you know, like couples therapy, um, and it's been absolutely incredible for us because we've been together nine years and we've been working together that entire time and we've had lots of things in our life happen to us together that have been incredibly stressful you know like we lost a business during covid all all these things and we were like actually we want to be the best versions of of we we want to have and invest in our relationship and and treat it as a very beautiful separate entity that needs to be nurtured and loved and when you work together live together your partner it's you know some of that becomes very very difficult to hold all together so we wanted to create space um with a third party and it's been absolutely it's been absolutely incredible mm. it's been really life changing so that's something you must see all the time yeah. like working with clients as you do yeah yeah all the time i mean especially when pe- when partners live and work together there's so much fusion right so there can become all this overlap that feels really safe a lot of the time and so wonderful yes. and like really satisfies those attachment needs but man can it kill a bedroom <laughs> yeah and yeah so have- So having a space, yeah, with a third party or a space where you kind of have a different dynamic really can can strengthen your bond 
without sacrificing the safety, but it can create enough room for there to be some erotic tension that comes back in. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it's really interesting what you said there, because there is such a, there, it just resonates so much because there is that really, really safe bond. You're kind of like, we're a team, we're in this together, you know, we're working on this business, we have the same values, the same vision. Um, but yeah, it's that kind of like intimacy part that that mm-hmm. does, especially because we work together right needs away, on, that needs, needs constant attention. It does need constant attention. I don't think we'd put so much attention mm-hmm. on like surviving at certain points in our relationship with the business that that sure. stuff kind of got sidelined. Um, but yeah, really fascinating, really fascinating stuff. And actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, you know, how if someone is kind of going back to what we were talking about before James asked that question, if someone is feeling like they've been together a long time, there might be a mismatch um, in um, sexual needs, um, there might be boredom, and that person can feel that they're getting to that point, what would you advise them to do? Mm. Yeah, uh, talk about it. And in a way that isn't threatening the relationship, right? I see a lot of partners say things like, if our sex life doesn't change, I'm out. (laughs) And that may be true. (laughs) That may be a boundary that they have for themselves. And it's fair, right? It's fair for everyone to have their own timeline. But making those threats to the relationship really changes the dynamic sexually because then the other partner starts feeling afraid and insecure and that gets in the way of their sex life. So I would say talk about it with vulnerability and respect for each other's positions. Understand that you're not hungry at the same time. You're not thirsty at the same time. You're not tired at the same time. You're not going to be horny at the same time and for the Mm -hmm. same things all the time, right? So Mm -hmm expect and embrace some diversity and really collaborate so that you're walking away from a conversation with a win-win. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that people should force themselves to have sex that they don't want to have. That's not what I'm saying. And if there is some overlap where there is opportunity for you to get more creative, perhaps by expanding what it means to be sexual, um, a lot of folks focus a lot on penetration being the defining act of their sexual experience, but maybe that's not something that you have energy for. So what else can you do? Can you engage in mutual masturbation or parallel masturbation? Can you lay together nude and watch a movie? Is that an interesting compromise? What does the sex really mean to you both that there is either a barrier or an interest? And I find that often the higher desire partner wants to be sexual, of course, but what they really want is what sex brings them. And that is connection, touch, um, uh, pleasure, some sort of like oxytocin dump in the body, right? Which you can get through many means, not just penetration. So when partners get creative and they say, Hey, we have this problem, we're going to solve it together. And we're going to do it in a way that we both walk away feeling pretty good. Um, that's a much better strategy than, than sort of approaching it like, oh, we have to compromise. Compromise always feels like I'm not going to get enough of what I want and that sucks and I'm leaving it all on the table. But negotiating for a win-win is like, all right, we're both in this. So if yeah. I give a little here, yeah, I'm going to give a little bit here and you're going to give a little bit here. And, and pretty soon you're approaching the problem from a place of generativity as opposed to a place of scarcity and frustration and resentment. And so I think you know, really being proactive, being non-judgmental, being curious is a way to help couples get unstuck. Um, but you have to do a lot of regulation to get there because if you've been frustrated for a while, it's really hard to like turn on a positive spin and not enter it from a, enter the conversation from a place of frustration. That's so amazing. I love that. Like, amazing advice. Really, Great really advice. helpful. Great advice. Um, it's been so fascinating talking to you. I know we could talk for hours. And I know, hours. I'm just looking at the time. <laughs> I know, we're mindful of your time. Listen, if if it's been so amazing, as, as you've Kate, so, really so many great, great truths you've dropped there. Um, if listeners want to learn more about your work uh, or your resources available at Modern Intimacy, how can they connect with you? Yeah, thanks. Um, the best place is my website, modernintimacy.com. 
Uh, we have a lot of really exquisite therapists. Um, we even have a therapist licensed in Portugal. Uh, and wow. we've got some coaches uh, who can work with folks internationally. So we have a lot of great resources. Um, and then my social media is at Dr. Kate Balistrieri on Instagram and TikTok. On YouTube, we're at Modern Intimacy. And folks can listen to my podcast, Get Naked with Dr. Kate. Get Naked awesome. with Dr. Kate. I love that. Get <laughs> Naked with Dr. Kate. Fantastic. <laughs> Bad podcast. Uh, we'll put all these links into the podcast notes, listeners, so you can find them easily. Um, Dr. Kate, it's, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really, really insightful. I know so many people are going to get so much from that because we certainly did. So thanks again for your time. Oh, thank you both. This has been such a fun conversation and it's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you. Yeah. You've been listening to the Midlife Mentors with Claire and James Davis. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. So drop us a line at info at themidlifementors.com with any questions or topic suggestions. And make sure you join us on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. You can find us under The Midlife Mentors. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and don't forget to take the Midlife Reset Audit now to receive personalised insights into what's holding you back from living your healthiest, happiest midlife. So go ahead and take the audit now at themidlifementors.com forward slash audit.